Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Linda McLaughlin, MCC, 2022 ICF Professional Coaches Global Board Vice Chair. Thank you and hello everybody. Welcome to the ICF Global Leaders Forum 2022. It is truly wonderful to be able to connect with you all here this evening or this afternoon, wherever you may be. As always, we are humbled and grateful for your participation and very thankful for your volunteer commitment and leadership. Now, before we begin our program for today, as chapter leaders, I'm sure you saw our publicly released statement noting that we are suspending our chapter activity in Russia, and you may be fielding some questions from our members. We would like to clarify that although we have temporarily suspended the Russian chapter and new membership and new credential applications, ICF will not revoke current Russian members and current credential holders, as well as current coaching education providers. Please note that the Russian government's actions and subsequent global sanctions imposed on Russia made it virtually impossible for ICF to support the chapter in Russia at this time. However, please know that we are in regular conversation with our colleagues in Ukraine and Russia and are seeking best ways that we can support them all at the moment. And please do reach out to your regional team who are there to support and clarify with anything else you need. Now, I would like to invite you all to take a moment of silence in memory of the victims of the Russian government's invasion of Ukraine. Thank you. It is a sad moment for the world as the Russian government's invasion of Ukraine continues to escalate. At ICF, we are thinking not just about the ways in which we can support all of our members, but also about how we can contribute through our unique work and expertise to others around the world whose lives have been threatened in many different ways. We have put together a list of helpful resources on our website, providing support for those going through hardship. You may use these resources for guidance and to support yourself, chapter members, clients and peers within our larger global community. And you'll find the link in the chat below. Now I'd like to share a message of welcome with you from our chair, Catherine Tenno, our VP of Professional Coaches, Steve Weiss, our CEO, Magda Mook, and our global board chair, Pat Matthews. It is truly a global gather uh, of our community. We are expecting more than 70 countries represented, which means almost 700 of you, nearly half of all chapters leader. This is representing 93% of chapters that have registered for this GLF 2022. This is a wonderful time for us to learn and collaborate with one another, one of each other, as we develop ourselves on our leadership journey together. The impact and influence of coaching continues to rise globally. And your leadership has been a crucial factor of that success. In fact, despite the pandemic, without your help, we reach an amazing milestone. Here is a video to celebrate some of our accomplishments in 2021.
again, thank you for your fantastic support. We are very proud of these achievements and we can all be proud of our, ourselves, of our community, of our coaches around the world. Now I want to introduce Steve Weiss, Vice President of ICF Professional Coaches. Steve, your turn. All right. Thank you, Catherine. That was truly impressive. And, and I'm happy to state that our, our milestones do not stop there. Um, we are actively working on a transformational path forward towards 100,000 members. Now, as we do that, our focus as an organization is, is on sustainable progress forward. And, and what I mean by that is we are working to create an infrastructure that helps you to lead the growth in your regions for ICF as we get on this path towards 100 worldwide members. So a couple of specific things that, that help us on that path. Um, we're focused in the next year here on growth and, and sustainable growth that adds resources. So we don't want growth to create challenge, we want growth to add resources as we drive forward. We're working on reshaping how we support you. And at the end of the day, we wanna have chapter leader tools and training that are improved and empower you in a new way to lead in your regions. We wanna make sure that there are technology enhancements for members and chapter leaders as well so that your experience as a user, both as a member in general and as a chapter leader is best in class and, and taking advantage of, of the tools that are out there for us. And then finally, we are also just looking to enhance our membership operations across the board, really again, focused on those primary growth drivers of member acquisition and retention. Now, although we're living in some challenging times here, I, I can assure you that we have amazing strategies in place. And in addition, we're benefiting from a growing coaching marketplace. And maybe the most important thing that we have here is the amazing collective energy of this group that we have to implement our plans going forward. So thank you for a second here. I, I am happy and proud now to introduce Pat Matthews, who's our Global Enterprise Board of Directors Chair. Pat? Hello, everyone. Great to have you here. And thank you, Katherine and Steve. I'm deeply saddened by the war in Ukraine and the fact that some of our dearest chapter leaders couldn't be present here with us as a result. GLF is a time to gather our community and therefore through our thoughts and prayers, we remain deeply connected to one another. For my part, I wanna highlight a few fantastic initiatives that'll continue to establish ICF as the leader in the industry. We've had active task forces working on these important projects, and I really want to thank everyone involved. We couldn't do it without you. First of all, our diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice initiative. Um, we had a task force working on, on this, and they completed their work. As a result, ICF has hired Lakeisha Brooks as director of DEI and J. And Lakeisha is also here present with us and will be a presenter at GLF and is in the process of forming a council. So you'll hear more about that shortly. We're pleased and welcoming for Lakeisha. The ICF values update, you've probably seen something about this, but the new values have been adopted and are the focus of everything we do and all updates are live on our website. I also want to um, acknowledge something that's going on right now, the ICF strategic initiative, its vision and mission. The strategic, pla pla the strategic planning task force is hard at work, and we thank all of you who have had input so far. We've had a lot of, um, a lot of thought and uh, energy going into that. And last, but certainly not least, I want to thank you, all of you, chapter leaders, for your outstanding contributions across the years. We'll continue to evolve our strong collaboration around the world to make this organization stronger than ever before. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Magdalena Mook, our ICF CEO. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kathleen. And welcome, 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 welcome. It's so good to see what 150 of you right now on the screen. It's been too long that we were having an opportunity to see each other. And uh, thank you for finding time in those um, challenging times 
that we are currently facing. And we really so appreciate your engagement and expertise. We saw in the video our tagline, uh, empowering the world through coaching. And this is because of you. So thank you for your partnership through this evolving journey for us. Coaching certainly is a unique process to support people overcome challenging times. And we'll continue to provide resources to assist you and your chapters. Also, coaching is emerging from the pandemic and yet facing new challenges, but stronger, more appreciated. And we know it because it's validated by our global consumer awareness research, showing that global awareness of professional coaching jumped again. And now it's at 70% worldwide. That is almost 20% jump in the last 12 years. Unprecedented, and thank you for that. More and more organizations are using coaching and building coaching cultures to support their teams and ultimately achieving greater results as the world is not becoming any less complicated. ICF credentials, again, we heard the milestone and by now we are almost at 44,000 credential coaches around the globe. So the credential, credentials are gold standard and commonly referred to as such. Our coaching education programs uh, is, uh, are attracting more and more providers worldwide as well. And we see a great application of coaching in amplifying and accelerating societal goals. And it is all because of committed professionals like yourselves who made a choice to become members and leaders for and of ICF. Thank you for that. And Catherine, now back to you. Thank you, Magda. Um, we will now officially launch our leadership journey, which is the theme for our GLF 2022. We will start with engagement, then move to education and growth. And finally, we will tackle innovation and succession plan. Each session will provide you content and tools to help you and your board to run successful ICF chapter even more successful because you are already very successful. So please take time to make connections, to share best practices, to learn together, to grow together. And we want you to go back home with great inspiration. Thank you. How inspiring and just so much to look forward to. The ICF story just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. Here are just a few housekeeping notes and um, please feel free to use the chat function to share your thoughts during the session today. And it's wonderful to see people coming in from all around the globe, introducing themselves. And I see you using uh, the chat function to share your LinkedIn profile. What a great way to network. Please be respectful of others and be mindful of the ICF code of conduct and our core values of professionalism, collaboration, humanity and equity as we go through our sessions. Translation is provided during general sessions using Worldly for breakout rooms and networking sessions. We recommend using Google Translate. And of course, don't forget the GLF workbook can be found under the live event tab on the GLF website. And you, this workbook is fillable if you're one of those people who likes to take notes as you go along. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote for this evening. Let me introduce Sarah Sladek. She has been referred to as a social equity expert and talent economy influencer. Over the past 20 years, she has become a renowned thought leader on topics of generational shifts, engagement strategies, and change management. Sarah is the founder and CEO of XYZ University and Sarah Sladek and Company, and most of the Save the Association's web show and member IQ podcast, and is the best-selling author of five books. Backed by years of experience and supported by solid research, Sarah remains committed to helping organizations plan for the future and prosper in the new economy. Sarah has recorded a special presentation for us on the future of membership, how to engage the next generation of ICF members, leaders, and volunteers. And now we play that presentation for you. Welcome to 
who or what comes next. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be urging you to be asking yourselves not just what comes next, after this pandemic and um, remote work environments and all the chaos, but actually asking yourselves who comes next. Because within ICF, we know that the organization needs younger members, younger volunteers, younger leaders. We have to be very mindful of the next generation. And regardless of where you are tuning in, we know this is a global phenomenon. Countries everywhere are challenged with engaging younger generations of members, volunteers, and leaders. So thank you for tuning in. I'm Sarah Sladek, your presenter. So let's get started. First and foremost, welcome to the end of work as we know it. That might sound really ominous, but we know that we are indeed at the end of an era, not just because of COVID. Oh no, this has been in process for quite some time. We know we're at the end of an era for a few key reasons. And the first one is the economy. Uh, we have had, ever since the dot-com bubble burst, extremely unpredictable, unstable economies. Extreme highs, extreme lows, and again, this isn't just relegated to one country, it's been observed throughout the world. That changes uh, consumerism, and it certainly changes membership. Now our members are wanting to know, well, if I'm spending $5 on membership, what do I get in return for my investment? And it doesn't matter whether it's $5 or $500. They want the answer to that question. We're all more conscientious consumers. So that changes our workplaces and our membership communities. The second reason that we know we're at the end of an era is technology. Technology has been rapidly changing for a period of time there. We had more technology developed in the span of five years than in the previous 50. Can you imagine? Well, yeah, we thought we were adapting really fast until we had a global pandemic and everyone was forced to use technology and to move on to Zoom and to work remotely. And all of a sudden, it became very apparent that many of us as leaders and organizations and workplaces, we weren't as tech savvy as we had hoped. But technology is continuing to advance and continuing to change our workplaces, which is partly why we're at the end of work and, and membership as we know it. And the third reason we know we're at the end of an era is the demographic shift. Here again, this has been a something that's been long in progress. We have known for several decades that at some point we would hit what's being referred to as the talent tsunami, the great resignation, the war for talent, all these very um, ominous words and phrases to describe this era we're in. But we knew it was going to happen because the baby boomer generation globally it's a very large generation. They were able to move into positions of power and influence and stay there. In fact, baby boomers were the workforce majority for 34 years. So it's no surprise that our organizations and workplaces got used to certain management principles and practices because we had this pretty much the same thing year in, year out for 34 years. But at the end of 2015, all of that began to change. And for the first time in a long time, our workforce started getting younger as opposed to older. And now the millennial generation is actually the workforce majority. That's ushering in all kinds of change. And we have to be mindful of those changes to be global leaders and to lead ICF. And then you throw in a global pandemic, and all of a sudden things become very, uh, again, unstable, unpredictable, constantly changing, incredibly challenging. That adds a whole nother layer to, uh, to, to growing membership and engaging a workforce and being effective at our leadership roles, as does increased awareness about social injustices and inequalities. We knew they were there, but now they're becoming impossible to ignore. We have to 
face. Major change. Any one of these things in and of themselves is challenging, but put them all together and whew, it's a lot. It's a lot. Some people have used the phrase of the world flipping upside down here and now because the change is so significant that it feels like everything we knew to be true, everything we got used to in our society is now being flipped. It's being re-examined. It's being turned upside down. And we have to kind of rebuild from the ground up. But there is hope. It's just a matter of us really, truly understanding how we got through this lens and how to flip things back or rebuild our future together collaboratively, which is where that generational piece comes into play. Now, before we can talk about building the future, building stronger chapters, engaging younger generations, we have to take a step back and we have to really understand how the heck did we get here? Um, we have to really look at generations, perhaps in a little bit of a different way. So bear with me, I'm going to take you on a very brief tour through history. When we look at um, when we look at generations, it's not an exact science. The information I'm going to share with you doesn't apply to every single person in every single age category. However, however, there are always major shared themes because whatever's happening in society in our childhood and adolescence, it shapes our values. And we carry those values throughout our entire lives, those shared experiences. So we tend to see common themes and um, traditions and values within each generational cohort. So as I mentioned, baby boomers, largest generation in history at that time, at that time. There was a huge population bulge. It was a post-war era. There were ample job opportunities, more people attending college. And you're looking at the typical grade school picture of this generation. Notice how everyone kind of looks the same. I have similar haircuts and similar outfits. Everyone's wearing dark shoes. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But the economy was booming. Uh, baby boomers actually became the wealthiest generation in history. And when you think about um, purchasing memberships, getting involved in associations like ICF, it made sense for that generation. They were told to be loyal to employers, loyal to country, and to join the association of your profession because it was the right thing to do. Uh, baby boomers are raised to follow a very similar life and career path as the generation that came before them and the generation that came before them. And that you would go to school, get a job, you would get married, you would have children in that order, I might add. And uh, you would get a job and work in that same job, sometimes for the same company, until you retired. Now, again, a lot has changed. Baby boomers have changed since then, but those are those values and those, those sets of beliefs that they were raised with. And then boom, there was a huge wave of change, which is why we have a lot of generation gaps. We started to see change happen more frequently. Gen X is born a much smaller population by comparison globally. They're uh, called X because they're born at the crossroads of cultural and social change. Um, civil rights, women's rights, all kind of, kinds of change started bubbling to the surface, much like what we're experiencing right now. You know, history does in many ways repeat itself. But one of the best visuals I can show to describe the change that was happening is of the Beatles, because the Beatles came on the scene at the tail end of the baby boomer generation in 1964 and notice once again how everyone kind of looks the same mm -hmm. but just three years later and it's 1967 we're in the gen x era and the beatles look like this so what happened <laughs> oh my gosh what happened change happened this is really key anyone born in 1964 and earlier was raised 
to value conformity. You blend in, you follow certain social rules. Um, you are reliable, you are loyal, you seek security, but anyone born in 1965 and later has been raised to value individuality. Do what you want, do what makes you happy. Some people blame this man for that because all of a sudden we had a childhood educator telling children, you are special, you are unique. Do what makes you happy. As long as you're doing what makes you happy, maybe that means divorce. Almost overnight, the divorce rate skyrocketed for the parents of Gen Xers, and they became the first generation of latchkey children, largely raised in either single parent households, two parent working households, or, um, uh, and, and again, this was before organized childcare and daycare programs. So this generation became very individual, self sufficient thinkers. The 1970s introduced, well, we're going on 50 years of massive layoffs, downsizing, mergers. Uh, baby boomers had ample job opportunities. Gen Xers became the first generation never to have known job security. In 1980, cable television rot might not seem like a very big deal, but all of a sudden you have access to news 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And sometimes that's good news, but let's face it, most of the time it's bad news. Now we have a generation being raised on more access to information, uh, negativity, more media coverage. They're the first to see the nation's leaders live, fail to deliver on their promises, be called into being accountable. They saw the dawn of customization, that's a trend that hasn't gone away, as well as the dawn of globalization. Instead of Woodstock, they were having live aid. But by and large, as you can see, change began to accelerate. New value systems began to be introduced. But we weren't done changing then. Oh no, boom, another wave of change. And the largest generation now, even larger than the baby boom, is born globally in every country. The millennial generation is the largest. And again, this is ushering in a lot of change. There's been some similarities to Xers. They too have seen the nation's leaders lie, fail to deliver on their promises. They've seen the fall of entire corporations due to unethical practices. They've had radically different childhood influences, like school shootings, a lot of violence close to home. September 11, we saw the pendulum shift from really hands-off parenting to what became known as helicopter parenting. In fact, millennials were raised as the most protected, supervised, provided for generation in history. High helmets, car seats, never eating in a cafeteria that serves peanut butter, moving home after college with mom and dad, all of these things shaped this generation. They've been dubbed the trophy generation because uh, they were the first to be rewarded for participation, not achievement. There's a lot of controversy around that, but we can't change it. It's how they were raised. And we know that this generation comes into organizations like ICF saying, uh, what's the return on investment? They have a very high ingrained need for ROI as a result of being raised as the trophy kids. They are the first to be raised using technology. In fact, on basic needs assessments, this generation would rank as children access to technology on the same level as access to oxygen and freedom. Think about that. That is where younger people are at in terms of tech savvy. And many of us struggle to transition to Zoom. Okay. The millennials also had a rocky transition from college to career because of the Great Recession. In contrast to the baby boomers, the wealthiest generation in history, millennials currently hold the status as being the most debt ridden. And there are lot, there's lots of skepticism as to whether they will ever reach the financial level of their parents or the baby boom. We know also that ICF is a millennial in many ways. Maybe you wanna think about that just a little bit. You were founded in 1995. Are you acting like millennials? 
for something else in your chapters. We'll get back to that in just a moment. And then boom, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce you to who is coming next, because that is the theme of this presentation, to be really thinking about the future and about younger generations and how to engage them. Gen Z has been raised using technology, but for them, it's always been mobile, literally at their fingertips. They've gravitated towards social media networks that are highly visual, highly instantaneous. In fact, there's now research to prove their brains have developed differently and that they obtain information and memories almost exclusively through photos and videos. So we're becoming a highly visual society, or at least we need to be. They've been raised during an era that celebrates diversity and inclusion. Think about anti-bullying campaigns, marriage equality campaigns. It's all about making sure everyone has a voice and a seat at the table. And interestingly enough, at the center of all, nearly all of their childhood storylines, there is a hero mentality. You're seeing just a few of those examples here. In our focus groups and interviews with this generation, we hear that hero mentality come out. If you have a Gen Z in your life, you know that they've kind of catapulted over childhood in typical adolescence right into young adulthood, worrying about the state of the world, especially as things have become more and more disrupted, and they carry the weight of the world on their shoulders in many ways. In fact, here are some photos of actual heroes within this generation who use uh, their voices and take action advocating for change. Now, have things flipped upside down? Yeah, in, in a matter of a, a, a few decades, we've seen substantial change in everything from consumerism, economics, technology, how we raise children, um, how we interact and communicate with one another. So my question for you is if young people entirely were empowered to lead ICF, if they had your role as a global chapter leader, what would they say about your chapter? What would they expect the membership experience to provide? Is there a gap in what you're providing currently? Who is coming next? Not just what. There's another way of looking at all this, and that is that, well, quite frankly, Xers and boomers, you are the last generations of the industrial era. And you might be thinking to yourself, that sounds crazy, Sarah, because the industrial era was founded in the 1700s. I mean, there's no way we've, we've, we've morphed beyond that. But have we? You see, in the industrial era, everything had a process and a system and a hierarchy. You would do A and then B and then C. You would start your career here and work your way up the ladder. Everything was very linear in its approach and its thinking. But for the generations born since 1982, which is when technology started to go mainstream, 1982, ever since then, there's nothing linear about their thinking and processing and how they work and communicate. It's, it's global. It's remote. It's instant gratification. It's on demand. It's personalized. It's customized. Everything it moves way faster and it is chaotic. So when they come into organizations that are very linear in their thinking and processing, they look at it and they say, that makes no sense to me. I don't see how I fit in here. I don't feel like I belong. Let me explain just a little bit further. These are the traits common in an industrial era thinking and managed organization. Hierarchy is prevalent. Um, it's all about making money, profits. Uh, they seek to value experience, they seek to be reliable, manage people, maintain the status quo, focus on the work, and they talk a lot about the past, the good old days. But for the generations born in the talent economy, which is the post-industrial era, 
it's been referred to as the talent economy because we need more human capital and we're realizing uh, the value of that human capital. It's the opposite in almost every way in those organizations. They're collaborative. They put their people first. They seek to be innovative and they are very adaptable. They're like Gumby. <laughs> They want to lead, to disrupt, they focus on their purpose and they talk a lot about the future. Now, my question for you is this, what is your leadership mindset and approach? How, what, is, what is the culture like in your chapter? How are you interacting with people? Do you tend to fall more in the practices that appear in that red category? or more in the practices that appear in the blue category. Because that's very telling about your ability to prepare for who is coming next and your ability to engage them. Now, if you were thinking to yourself, well, my leadership and our chapter, we are entirely in the blue zone, then fantastic. However, I'm going to challenge you a little bit and say, eh, you might not be, because presently, ICF has 10% of members who fall into the millennial category. And I have to remind you that this year, the oldest millennials turn 40. So they are nearing middle age. They are not the young professionals anymore. They have been in the workforce. They are seeking places to connect or already have places to connect. Only 10% of millennials. That tells me that there's work to be done in the chapters and in how we lead and how we engage people and that we're not making room for younger people, the next generation to belong. Also, ICF has a large number of members retiring in the next five years, which is why this conversation and reflection is more critical than ever before. If you are thinking to yourself, we are really stuck, ask yourself why you're stuck. And I can tell you, I'm gonna give you a little cheat sheet here <laughs> as to why. The most common reason organizations and leaders get stuck and unable to engage future generations and unable to adapt to new ideas or new practices, it really boils down to fear. All of us, Every single one of us has to some degree a fear of change. And let's face it, right now we're being asked to change a whole heck of a lot about ourselves, about our, our organizations, our workplaces, about our world. And our brains put up these little roadblocks and say, ah, it's too much, it's too much change. And we become fearful, we become angry, we become tired, and so we just don't do it. But there is a solution. And the solution is quite simply this. We have to bring people together in community to collaborate. If we're working in silos, if we're still very hierarchical, if we're working in echo chambers where everyone at the leadership table has similar experiences, skill sets, and backgrounds, not really truly collaborating. The idea of collaboration is to bring new ideas, new people to the table, to glean valuable insights to both learn and teach from one another. This is a unique time in uh, history because never before have we, uh, has every generation had something to learn as well as something to teach. And that goes back once again to that industrial era mindset, that hierarchical mindset. In fact, we've had hierarchy since game mandates, since the beginning of time. The elder of any given society had all the wisdom, all the power, all the knowledge, everyone gathered around and learned from the elder. But here and now, we're realizing that young people have as much to contribute as the more experienced people. And we can learn and teach one another. We need to collaborate. When we collaborate, 
And we bring people from both columns together, that red and blue, you mix red and blue, it makes purple. When we collaborate, we work side by side. We bring um, younger professionals to work side by side with very experienced professionals. A great thing happens. We tend to be more empathetic of, of one another, see one another's points of view. And that leads to trust. And trust leads to a sense of belonging. And belonging leads to engagement in the organization. It all, if you want to engage different generations, younger generations, you need to start by inviting them in to problem solve, discuss, idea, idea and um, just be part of your community, to collaborate side by side with you. Because engaging people is impossible until you truly understand them. And that can only come from time spent building a relationship with them. It's not enough to say we're putting up a, we're going to go on um, TikTok. So we're just going to put up that TikTok and we're going to sit back and say, all right, here they come. Here come all the young people. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to be, have a relationship with people. You know, and that relationship comes from spending time with people. We have to understand what truly challenges our members right now, members of different age groups, because it's not a one size fits all. It is not. Everyone's dealing with pandemic and, and challenge and change very, very differently. So I'll share with you, in our firm, we do um, generational studies all the time and we do research. We just simply ask this question among many others, but I'm pulling out this question for an example. We ask what's challenging you. And again, it's not every single person, but there are major, major trends in the data, um, significant trends. The majority of baby boomers say they're really challenged with change right now, leading through this time of change. Gen Xers say they're really challenged with work-life balance, trying to figure it all out, raise children, as well as have a prosperous career. Millennials are still saying, they're trying to, their challenge with being taken seriously. And here's a preview of what's coming next, who and what's coming next. For Gen Z's, teens, early 20-somethings, they are challenged with anxiety about the future. You need to do this work for yourself to, again, begin to have that empathy and understanding of what is happening in your membership community. You ask those questions. Also, another step is to bring leaders together in your chapter to have some conversations, some exploratory discussions. For example, if young professionals, let's say if millennials led our chapter, it was all millennials all the time. If they led our chapter, what would they do differently? Begin to brainstorm. Better yet, if you actually bring millennials in to tell you what they would do differently and to share their ideas and you listen. But at minimum, you should have these exploratory discussions with your leadership and really start thinking about where those gaps to engagement exist. One answer I know for certain from our research is that millennials would say, I want to be invited. We, we've, we, we've learned that Xers and boomers are more likely to seek out associations and membership opportunities and volunteer opportunities for themselves. Um, they'll do the research, then they'll join, then they'll sit back and observe for a little bit until they feel comfortable jumping in, raising their hand and getting involved. Millennials are the opposite. They say, oh, well, I didn't join because no one invited me. I didn't get involved because no one invited me. So that invitation is so incredibly important. That leads immediately to a sense of belonging. Um, they want constant opportunities to volunteer, lead, participate, share their skills. And then the cycle repeats. If you want to take this an even step further, which I would strongly encourage your organizations to do, You've not only ask what young professionals would do differently if they were leading, you start asking what would teenagers do? <laughs> what if teenagers were leading your chapter? What would they be doing differently? 
brainstorm, bring in the ideas, um, begin to realize where you are lagging behind, where you have fear of change, where you are hanging out in that red zone, not willing to move into the blue zone. It's imperative that we move over and begin to have these future focused discussions because change is already here. It's already here, it's already happening. But also we wanna make sure that we stay relevant and meaningful in a time of incredible disruption and change. But the other thing is what's happening to teenagers right now, whether you like it or not, it's trickling up and it's influencing you. And it may take a little bit of time but we've seen it with pretty much every major social trend throughout history. It starts with the youngest generation. It trickles up, it influences the masses. Now you are either um, slow to respond or quick to respond. You're either anticipating the change or resisting the change and failing to see the opportunity. If you want younger generations involved, you gotta be paying attention to what's happening in their lives. Their lives, we're all very disrupted right now, but imagine through the eyes of youth, the disruption that's happening. They've been raised in many ways to compete. They have increased access via technology and a whole heck of a lot of change is happening. Just in brief, with looking through the eyes of a teenager, uh, Gen Z started out at a very young age being encouraged to compete in the aftermath of the Great Recession. A lot of parents panicked and thought, we have to raise our children to be exceptional at something. And so they've been under pressure to have good grades, to um, acquire and master a, a skill, and to be very marketable to colleges and careers. That pressure to compete. They've been raised during an era where there's always been help wanted signs. They have their choice of any job. People are seeking them, demanding their attention, vying for their uh, participation. So you wanna be ahead of the curve because there's other organizations that will be vying for their participation as we go forward. They're holding organizations accountable. They wanna be a part of an organization that leads, that has values, uh, to be inclusive and to build healthy communities. And if you're not doing that, they're going to call you out on it. You got to be aware of that as well as we begin to grow membership. We have to be aware of the fact that this generation um, has had to interact with the world, going to school uh, with masks, lots of safety protocols, lots of rules. This is beginning to influence them a little bit. They're going to want organizations that likewise have that code of accountability, the, the rules of conduct that we're, we're going to uphold positive, healthy communities. And during all of this challenge and change, they coped, they have coped and continue to cope by using and tapping into their creativity, posting videos and uh, using their humor, but also using social media as a platform for raising their voices for change. That's what teenagers are thinking about. They think, the majority of them think they will make a bigger difference in terms of global politics. They think creativity is really kind of one of the most important valued aspects of their lives. They think they want to start businesses. They're very, very entrepreneurial. And they think they want flexible work. When you think about all these things, um, it makes sense that many of them may grow up to be coaches or grow up wanting a coach in their life. So ICF has a, has a place here to be important. But the question will always come back to this. Will those young people, when they come to your doorstep, whether as members, as volunteers, as leaders, or even prospective coaches, employees, the question will always come back to, do I feel like I belong here? Will I belong at ICF? And if you have any doubt at this point as to whether younger people can say with absolute confidence, a resounding yes, I will belong here. 
it makes sense for me to join. I am a valued participant of this community. If there's any shadow of a doubt that you can't say yes to any of those questions, then you need to self-reflect. You need to collaborate. You need to go back to basics. You need to understand that we may be at the end of membership as we know it, the end of work as we know it, the end of an entire era as we know it. But that doesn't mean we're at the end of needing to belong. That doesn't mean we're at the end of ICF altogether. It means it's your responsibility as a global leader to begin to plan and prepare for the future. It's on your shoulders to build relationships with the next generation and create a space for them to belong. It's not just about what is coming next, it's about who is coming next. That's how you engage the next generation. I'm Sarah Sladak. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Sarah. What a thought-provoking um, presentation. And I just love that last question, who's coming next? So we're going to move into breakouts now, a chance to meet and discuss what you've just heard. And you will see the questions coming up on the screen. And these questions will be the basis for your discussion in your breakouts. Um, please take a note of these. You can just take a photo of it on your phone. You'll also find it in your workbook, page seven, and they'll also be in the chat function for you. Please appoint a member of your group as a rapporteur, and we'll try and do a quick check back once we're all in plenary again. So with that, let's go to breakouts and enjoy 15 minutes of discussion with your peers. Welcome back, everybody. Those 15 minutes went so quickly. Let's hear from a few of our breakout group leaders now just on one or two nuggets. I'd ask you to be brief so we can call in as many people as possible. And can we please welcome Kathleen Lehanda. Hi, Kathleen, give us a wave there. She's Program Director for Strategic Initiatives with the ICF Hello. Foundation. Welcome, Kathleen. And Kathleen will help with uh, moderating this part. So if you'd like to contribute your group's ideas, please raise your hand or else type in your key points into the chat function. Over to you, Kathleen. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Uh, I can see Joy Marie. We can start with Joy. Thank you so much. Just to say in our group, we had Kerry Williams, the ICF president of the LA chapter, Iris Balogulo, a president from the ICF Greece chapter, uh, Carola Afridis from the Chilean chapter, and then myself from South Africa. Um, in terms of the first question, just some highlights, whether the chapters are more industrial or talent-based. Certainly, um, Kerry Williams explained from um, their particular chapter, there's a strong emphasis on building individuals as a coach, but there's a good blend of industrial and talent base. Um, for Iris from Greece, their focus was mainly on industrial. They had five pillars, which five pillars, sorry, which they focused on in, in particular, the environment, um, youth and arts, combining that also with coaching and the impact. And then certainly for, for Chile, the chap, the pandemics created its own difficulties. Um, and so there's some reorganization that's happening in that particular chapter. In South Africa, um, there's a brand new ICF board that's just been appointed. And so these are good self-reflective questions for the board. And then just briefly, we only got to the second chapter, we had robust discussions on the leadership. Are they fearful, open to change? Again, it was a curious questions for good for the chapters to consider. One of the chapters expressed that they like to think they're open to change, but the challenge is often with identity and ego involved. And this can slow both the growth and the change. So, you know, DEIJ can be great in theory, but in practice difficult for some. Um, and then in the Greece, leadership is not fearful because it's focused on team effort, sharing creativity, and also empowering leaders. So there's decentralized leadership. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow, thank you so much, Joy. That was very informative. Uh, I'll hand over to Amy. 
Yeah, so my summary will not be as comprehensive, um, but I will uh, just pull out one thought. We had some people um, in our uh, leadership group who are born in the early 80s, and we were talking about the experience of being the youngest person or one of the younger people in our coach training and that transferring into the leadership role. And something about the formality, the hierarchy, the emphasis on years of experience and how we welcome people who may have been, you know, be newer coaches, but have a lot to add and how we make sure they feel like their experiences are valued even if they don't have the years behind it. So we had a discussion about that and then we started talking about how um, for some of us the pandemic really pushed and propelled boards to change the way they offered services, the way they delivered um, and so we, we started talking about that and then the timer ran out. So. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. I'm sorry the time went out on you. I hope you can get another opportunity to share your thoughts. Um, I'll also invite Barbara to share some thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. We had people from Slovakia, Argentina, New Mexico, Sacramento, and Washington State. Thank you all for the discussion. Um, uh, I shared from our chapter's experience that we have had conversations. We didn't use the phrases industrial or talent, but we have thought about the polarities that are present in our leadership style, such as when are we more process focused? When are we more relationship focused? Uh, we heard from another chapter who, you know, we realized we spend all this time focused on retaining the MCCs, the people with more experience, which usually tends to mean more years, may mean older, and had not spent as much time thinking about how to invite or welcome um, coaches from the millennial or Gen Z. So there was a switch in focus that we identified. Um, one chapter uh, is seeing that they already have most of their leadership from um, the millennial base. And so that felt uh, unique amongst the rest of our chapters. Um, we then uh, diverted our conversation into thinking about at what age does one become a coach? And so many of us share the experience of having gone through an industry or a few like me, and then you find coaching and you're like, aha, this is the culmination. This brings all of me together and you go into service in that way versus someone who's just out of school or not even through school and sees this as a fast path or they're drawn to it for some other reasons. And so we had this um, you know, open conversation about that and we were looking at the differences between some coach training programs that may in fact have a, an age requirement, um, no coach trainees under 30. Um, and then someone shared an experience where uh, their um, son had gone through a coach training program at a younger age, at age 21, and what a benefit to his life that has been, regardless of the fact that he didn't go into coaching as an industry at this moment, just what an impact that had on his life. And that concluded our conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been able to receive all the report out so far. 